This is Lauren Schoenberg coming to you in March 2021, and it's my great pleasure to share this January 14th, 1990 radio broadcast. Actually, it's a it's an excerpt of a long show that day uh, devoted to the music of Tommy Flanagan. Most of the show uh, was listening to his recordings under his own name, his songs and his, his trios and solo recordings. Uh, I had run into him a few days earlier in a nightclub and mentioned I was doing the show, and lo and behold, he showed up at the radio station and wanted to hang and let me pick the records. Uh, and, you know, he was so patient with me when I listened to the questions in the conversation now. Uh, you know, he insisted I call him Tommy on the air. We talked about that. Uh, but still, uh, you know... Uh, <laughs> if I could do it now, it would be a different interview. But that's a different story. It's not so much about me, of course. It's, it's about Tommy Flanagan. And he comes across loud and clear. You know, the way he played was the way he talked, was the kind of person that he was, gentle and uh, deep. I hope you enjoy this. For those of us who were lucky enough to be in a world with Tommy Flanagan in it, who knew him, does it bring him back? And I know there's a lot of musicians who may hear this, especially the pianists, and uh, listening to his voice, does it bring him back just 100%? Uh, of course, he had that great trio in his later years uh, with Kenny Washington and Peter Washington, who accompanied him so beautifully. It was a kind of a magical time. Going to hear Tommy Flanagan with his trio uh, it was always like going to see a great play or a great movie. It wasn't song after song as much of it was a really well thought out and programmed concert. And uh, anyway, let's get to the interview and the music. And thank you for listening to this. And here's to Tommy Flanagan. He'll, his music will live forever. And uh, Tommy, I'd like to welcome you back up to KCR. Hey, Lauren. How you doing? Very good. Okay. Thanks for coming up today to help us uh, pick some of the records, because you, you can attest to we have so many records up here today. I know I'm going to leave some great ones out. I had no idea. There was <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea. So many. Yeah. Uh, what I'd like to do before we get to the interview per se uh, is just go back and announce the records we heard. And as we do, maybe I could just ask you about your association with each of these great tenor men. And, uh, of course, we just heard you with Dexter Gordon. When did you first uh, get to know Dexter? And Well, contrary to the belief <laughs> that's uh, written in a lot of uh, history books, uh, I didn't uh, first have my first gig with Dexter in 1945. <laughs> that was, I would have been still in high school, as, right. uh, according to when I was born and all that. And uh, No, I've, I really actually met Dexter, in, I believe, in the 60s here in New York. Mm -hmm. And Birdland, I think. And, uh, yeah, he was either on his way to Europe or back, or in one of those transition periods. But, uh, but I've uh, certainly known him for a, a, a long time and, and knew about him much longer because he was. He started at a very early age. I saw him with Lionel Hampton's big band oh in, in the forties. It must have been. Yeah. I think I, th I think he was in the ham span in the 1941, 42, and 43. Yeah. Well, I didn't. <laughs> Maybe I did see him one of those uh, early years. Like. Yeah. Was that when you were still in Detroit and he came I was through still in the Detroit, band? Yeah. yeah. He was in the band. I, mean. I, uh, I forget the other tenor player. Illinois Jaquette? Maybe it was El Norte. Yeah. Right? I think so. uh, your association with uh, Dexter Gordon has gone right up to the present because you did a, a quartet gig with him up in, uh, up in uh, Connecticut. Up in uh, Stanford. Yeah. yeah. About a year ago. Yeah. Well, we heard Tommy Flanagan with Dexter Gordon. Any uh, memories of this session in particular? This was done for Prestige. This is the one where, where you did the Christmas song, which is such a beautiful rendition. Right? Mm, when, and it was in uh, July, right? Christmas yes. in July. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, a no, that's a, that's a, sl a, a sleigh ride. <laughs> a sleigh ride. ride in July. <laughs> or yeah. Anyway, it was, uh, I remember it was, um, yeah. Mm. Right, I had some time off. I was still working with, uh, what, uh, what year was? is this? 1970. Yeah, right. right. So I was off a break in the, the schedule. Yeah. yeah. And that's when that happened. 
it's hard to get in the spirit of Christmas so in, in July. <laughs> July. Well, maybe they, maybe they turned the air conditioner up. <laughs> <laughs> we followed that with a uh, Curtis Fuller record called Blue Zet. Al Harewood on drums, Jimmy Garrison on bass, and of course, Tommy Flanagan on piano, uh, Curtis Fuller on trombone, and Benny Golson on the tenor saxophone. And this was recorded in May 1959 for Savoy Records, and we heard a beautiful old tune, Love, Your Magic Spell is Everywhere. Hmm. And uh, this was from 1959. Could you tell us about uh, Benny Golson and your friendship with him? Oh, I've, yeah, I've known Benny for, uh, I guess, since the uh, Jazz Messenger days when he was... Uh, a member with uh, I guess Lee Morgan and and uh, Curtis, and we were recording about that time. And there was a a group of uh, composers and arrangers that were really close. Had almost like a, a collective, you know, it was Horace Silver and Gigi Grice, Benny Goldson, and uh, they had a they just pooled a lot of music together. And uh, I think Macintosh and uh, that's when I got to meet uh, all these fine young writers, yeah. and I got to know a lot of their music. But but I've been knowing him since uh, uh, since I arrived in New York, I guess, or early after, you know, yeah. late fifties. That's from an album reissued under Curtis Fuller's name, and it's called Blues. And again, we heard "Love Your Magic Spell Is Everywhere," and that was Tommy Flanagan. It's a funny thing, Fuller. you know. I I remember uh, doing dates with Benny and uh, uh, Curtis. But I, I didn't remember that rhythm section being yeah. uh, Jimmy Garrison, yeah, or whoever that, the drummer was, uh, Al Harewood. Mm. That's one of the great uh, pleasures of, of doing this show, outside of, of listening to the great piano playing all the time, is is the phenomenal combinations of rhythm sections. I mean, there's one over here with, uh, you know, Oscar, you with Oscar Pettiford and Shadow Wilson, and there's another one with Oscar Pettiford and Elvin, yeah. you know, and all these combinations, you know, yeah. and it, it it's really magical. I mean, how was it? Uh, Back in the fifties, when when you're doing all this freelance work and uh, and recording and 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 club work, um, most of the rhythm sections that you wound up in the studio with, had you actually done gigs with most of these guys at one point, or were many of the meetings f- of the rhythm sections mm-hmm. first time in the studio? A lot of times, it was first time was it would be in the studio, and a, a lot of the horn players also would be a, a first time meeting, or, or maybe the only time you would uh, ever play with. On some of these groups, would be in a studio, I guess. and it was, well, you know, like I, I think you played something earlier that uh, be hard hard to conceive that uh, I would be on a date with Buck Clayton and Pee Wee Russell, you know? <laughs> but uh, but I remember them, and uh, it was they were kind of memorable dates, you know. After you uh, yeah. think back and listen back, you know, years later, yeah. But uh, most of these rhythm sections, I guess, were just assembled for the date, so it, that makes it even the mo- all the more amazing how, how greatly cohesive they, they all are, really. So uh, we had you with Jimmy Garrison and Al Harewood on that record. We followed that with an album that uh, paired you with gentlemen who you did record a bit with, George de Vivier on the bass and Charlie Persip on the drums, and that was with Bud Johnson's quintet from the early 60s, oh, from 1960. Uh, Bud on the tenor, his brother Keg Johnson, on trombone, and of course Tommy Flanagan from Let's Swing, the Bud Johnson Quintet, and we heard a great version of Falling in Love with Love, which had that long meter in there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I do remember that date. Uh, yeah. Because, I don't know, Bud was, he was one of my favorite like uh, musician and tenor player, reed players. He was, he was just wonderful. Yeah. What was it about Bud that... Uh, that uh, I like the way he used to... Uh, I mean, he wrote so many things that were uh, just uh, like standard things, but he had a way of arranging them that would, you know, bring him out of the ordinary. Just you say, well, what can he do with a tune like this? And uh, I mean, you'd end up like really, you want to, you want to play it and put it in your repertoire, you know, like yeah. it'd be one of your arrangements uh, that you would play. I mean, he was, he was a great uh, transcriber too. I never heard anybody could take things when he took off. Uh, and uh, Queer Notions uh, from Fletcher Henry, the uh, Coleman Hawkins piece. I couldn't believe it. He did that for one of those uh, um, Lincoln Center oh, yes. uh, tributes to Coleman Hawkins. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't think he could could do all <laughs> that. The inter close uh, harmony and yeah. things. Yeah. Uh, 
over the years, did you, did you get to work with Bud much? Uh, actually, on, on gigs and things? I did some oh. gigs with Bud. Not a lot, but uh, right. well, we did. I had a, an association with Bud for through the years, you know. I like, uh, Maybe we would play uh, maybe a lot at one period. And right. then a, certainly that would lead up to a, a, a recording. And then, a, well, it's... Yeah, we had a, a good relationship uh, through the years. Yeah. And surprisingly, I, I did with a lot of uh, uh, tenor saxophonists. Which yes, well, as we see here, uh, all these ones you recorded with. And, uh, well, that leads me to, well, actually, I'm going to finish the identification of the records because then I'll get carried away with questions, and I'll forget to mention the last one we heard, which was you with Gene Ammons, and we heard uh, something from a Prestige album recorded in 1967, Boss tenor Gene Ammons with Ray Barreto on conga, Art Taylor drums, Doug Watkins on bass. I think it must have been before then. Yes, that's an earlier recording record. Doug Watkins wasn't around at that point. This was uh, in 1960. 60, Art, yeah. yeah. Uh, Art Taylor, Doug Watkins, Tommy Flanagan, and Gene Ammons on tenor sax. And we heard Close Your Eyes, which you had also recorded with Coleman Hawkins and uh, Milt Jackson a few years earlier. Uh -huh. I remember that day, too. It was, I think, it's probably the quickest record date I ever made. <laughs> How was that? I think we left, uh, left my apartment about noon, and I was b back in my apartment at 3 o'clock. <laughs> we recorded over in Jersey at uh, right. Van Gelder's. <laughs> uh, he only listened to one thing back, and it was like a, a half of uh, uh, the ballad that was on the date. Right. And everything was, felt right to him. So it was, uh, I think he had just... Uh, come back from, you know, his uh, a little stay f in uh, Chicago for, mm -hmm. I don't think he had touched his horn hardly that much, but he <laughs> came out <laughs> and did this date. There's a gold record, you know, like Canadian Sunset. Yeah. Uh, he's fabulous. Yeah. Boss Tenor, G Gene Emmons, when, when did you first get, get to know Gene? Also back in D Detroit? or Well, I didn't really know him, but I right. used to go, he used to play uh, dances in Detroit a lot, and I right. used to go see that see his band because it was uh, another I was attracted to these tenor players and they always had great bands you know had good young players and uh, I think it's one of the first times I heard this fabulous drummer out of uh, Chicago the legendary Ike Day Ike it, it was either with Gene's band or, or somebody came from Chicago with uh, with this drummer it was really electrifying you yeah know, Ike Day, one of those uh, guys who only made a couple of recordings, and, but right. yet, yet anyone who ever heard him always says that he was one of, one of the great. Yeah, he's a special kind of talent. Yeah. We're talking with Tommy Flanagan, and this is Jazz Profiles on WKCR-FM in New York, 89.9 on your FM dial. It's 443, and this is part two of Jazz Profiles on Tommy because last week Ted Pankin hosted a marvelous six-hour show featuring the more recent solo and trio recordings of Tommy Flanagan. And uh, this afternoon, going till 8 this evening, we're focusing on the uh, recordings from the 50s, 60s, and the first part of the 70s, and featuring a lot of, uh, of great horn players and, and, and a lot of great different situations that Tommy got into. Tommy, I'd, I'd like to ask you about your playing, like, f for instance, with, with Benny Golson and with Dexter Gordon, with John Coltrane on the one hand, and then also working with uh, Gene Ammons and Hawkins and Ben Webster and the others on the other hand. Um, how did you uh, approach playing with these gentlemen? Was there ever a change of what you had to do to try and, and, and fit them, or was what they did so marvelous that it didn't make a difference? I mean, how did It didn't how make did any difference to me. It didn't, you approach? Yeah. <laughs> didn't seem to make any difference to them. You know, like, uh, I, I never had any right. great demands from them on, right. you know, like, what to do. But I, I always felt like I, I would know what to do with, with these great uh, uh, instrumentalists. I mean, and they all had such huge sounds, you know, and individual sounds. That, uh, I mean, it was, uh, you could get lost, you know, easily <laughs> behind them. But uh, thank goodness that there's dials, you know, like <laughs> you can tune me up. And, uh, right. Um, how was it working with them in terms of uh, like making what you know what are known as uh, quartet arrangements, rhythm section arrangements, trying to structure these records? I mean, your the in, the introductions are always so beautiful, and the and there always seems to be a real uh, there's, there's such great pacing and and all these things to these performances. When you're in the studio now, f 
Let's Take This Record that's on top of your, for instance, you mentioned Gene Ammons, it was a gold record came out of the session and yet mm -hmm. it was just like a one take record date. I mean, how would it go down uh, when uh, someone like Gene Ammons would call a tune in the record studio? I mean, would they well, decide what to do or would you usually uh, suggestions we would, we or how did it work? Uh, well, I get together with with the rhythm section, the bass player, and, uh, right. and uh, we'd figure out something and, uh, and play it. Maybe uh, if, it, if it was agreeable with whoever's right. playing, you know. Usually it was. You know, cause <laughs> what, what are they going to say? Come up with the way. I got something better than that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but uh, uh, I think it caused a lot of early burnout and a lot of <laughs> from all those sessions. You know, doing everything out of your head. You know, yeah. all these uh, hundreds of. I mean, each session, you know, like making up all these introductions. But uh, it's a good challenge, and I was uh, uh, had enough uh, mm. uh, maybe imagination to, to come up with something. And, uh, and certainly uh, the song itself suggests something that you can use uh, for an intro yeah. or an ending. So yeah. it wasn't as hard as it uh, may seem. Yeah. Uh, what was... Uh, Special. I mean, you already mentioned that the that these gentlemen, and of course, it wasn't just tenor players you recorded with. You recorded with with, with virtually every instrument. Um, what was it uh, about them that made them so special? You you mentioned that they all had their own sound, but let's let's focus in on on one association of yours that was very very special, and that was the one you had with Coleman Hawkins. Um, what was it like playing with Coleman Hawkins for someone who who never did? Well, <laughs> well, you know, I can you put it in, in words? I or is that to, not uh, a fair question. You no, know, when I when I was a kid, you know, when I first heard, uh, well, I guess Body and Soul was probably the first uh, in, in a very popular jazz uh, instrumentalist uh, record that that I heard, and the, and there was so much in it, you yes. know, like so much detail and. Uh, and work that went into it. It's like a masterpiece coming out of uh, the more I read about it, I said, wow, what a marvelous musician, never knowing that I would meet this person and uh, have a chance to play with him. Right. And, uh, and when I did, when I got to New York, he was uh, a little hard for me to meet at first, but uh, after one recording date that we did together, it was, we had a friendship that lasted until, you know, until he passed away, it was it was a great uh, meeting him. I probably one of the uh, finest musicians I ever known because he he knew everything so well. It just the way he could transpose, look at a sh piece of sheet music and read any clef, and it was uh, it was kind of easy doing uh, introductions with him because he could see anything on the page and say, "Well, I'll take this line. I'll take this." Thing. Yeah. Uh, uh, there was this uh, piece from the No Strings album. I think there was a long uh, uh, bass line, you know, was broken up in tenths. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'll, I'll just play that line, you know, like maybe, I think a man that has everything, which he certainly had. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he just said, well, I'll, I'll take this line here. You play the melody on. And it was, I said, wow, I said, it was a big skip, you know, like. Yeah. But he's, that sound, you know, he could play the low note and the... <laughs> In the middle, you know, the yeah. tenth, you know, like, well, I played the tonic, the seventh, and, <laughs> and the tenth above. Right. So, well, that's, he was really a, well, that's, he impressed me a lot, you know, yeah. his, his musicianship. What was Coleman Hawkins like as a, as a, as a friend, if, if, I, if I might ask you a non-musical question? What, what was his personality like? How, how would you describe him to someone who, who never met him? He was a, he's a very warm person and he was uh, accept you in and um, I mean it was like a, like an open house you know when he invited you over he sit down and we have a nice uh, I mean what a conversationalist he could talk about a, a lot of things he liked to cook he had good taste and uh, had the best spirits around and uh, he had a good piano <laughs> he had a, and he, I guess he must have played a little bit himself but uh, Never heard him do that much. Sit down and play a few chords, but, but he always had, you know, the finest uh, instruments. You know, his uh, he had a Steinway, like uh. from the, the new, uh, and that new upright that when it came out. That's uh, just to uh, save space. I'm sure if he had 
if he had a bigger apartment, he would have had a bigger Steinway. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. But he was, uh, he did, and his uh, equipment, recording equipment was, uh, was top, top of the line, and his, uh, his selections, uh, recordings, was a little strange, you know. What was that like? <laughs> they were all classical. Really? Uh, he didn't have any jazz records, and unless the record company would send him some things. But he had like complete uh, Wagnerian operas, and when they would went from uh, LPs into well, because he just mm -hmm. upgraded everything mm -hmm. as they, as they changed. Mm -hmm. nice. I can kind of hear some of the opera singer in his playing. Yeah, in a sense, I mean, <laughs> it really does sound like that. It's uh, about ten minutes before the hour, five o'clock, and I'm going to run to the records that are a few feet away and grab one. I want to play with Coleman Hawkins right now. Right. Could uh, could you give us the dates of that gig you're doing at Sweet Basil? Because I want to stress that we're talking about Tommy Flanagan in the 50s and 60s with all these great records. But the uh, important thing is that the Tommy Flanagan trio is, uh, is on a break from their international touring and right now we'll be doing a New York engagement. And I gave the wrong personnel before because I guess Kenny will be out of town or something. So could you tell us exactly yeah. what's happening? Well, we're... Uh, my next gig will be with the trio. Is at Sweet Basil. It starts on the 23rd of January. It's a two-week engagement, and I guess that will take us up to about February the uh, hmm, whenever it is. If I had a calendar in front of me. Well, anyway, it's a, and it's uh, George Moraz on bass and uh, a new personnel change. It's uh, Lewis Nash will be on drums. And, uh, all right, and that's the Tommy Flanagan Trio at Sweet Basil coming up, and I believe also uh, sometime in February there's going to be another gig, which we will be talking about more then. Mm -hmm. And uh, But the big news is Tommy Flanagan at Sweet Basil coming up in just, a, I guess, a week. It's a two-week engagement. It's a two-week engagement. Yeah, right. it starts on the 23rd. Of right, January. so that's, that's two weeks almost. It takes us up to February something early in, yeah. I don't know. What. At a week from Tuesday. Mm -hmm. That's when it starts. It's eight minutes before five o'clock, and I have in front of me one of my all-time favorite records. And, and instead of me picking the track, I'm going to give it to Tommy, and he can tell us what track he wants to hear from this. This is um, At Ease with Coleman Hawkins, with Wendell Marshall on the bass and O.C. Johnson on the drums, and, of course, Tommy Flanagan on piano with Hawkins. And um, they, this is such a beautiful record. Uh, mm. Hard to pick one. Well, it is. So, uh, what, what would you like to hear? For you, for me, forevermore. Ever ah, yes. <laughs> Thank you. 
That was Coleman Hawkins, and for you, for me, forevermore, Tommy Flanagan on piano and uh, O.C. Johnson on drums and Wendell Marshall on the bass. And it's just turning 5 p.m., and you're listening to WKCR-FM in New York, 89.9 on your FM dial, coming to you in stereo. Lauren Schoenberg here with my guest, Tommy Flanagan, who's up here with us at KCR this afternoon, making this even more of a, of a red-letter day. And... Um, I asked you during, while we were playing the record if O.C. Johnson actually worked in jazz clubs because I know he was such a busy studio guy. I didn't know whether he actually even had time to be, to be doing gig yeah, gigs. Yeah, he sure did. Uh, yeah. I, I played gigs with uh, O.C. in a couple of ballrooms, you know, uptown. And it was, it was, uh, it would be his date. He'd, it was his band. He'd picked it, you know, like O.C. was a good arranger, too. You know, I've and heard. played alto. I, I didn't know. I, I walked into uh, <laughs> one of his. Uh, a rehearsal at the old NOLA Studios down on uh, 52nd Street and, and uh, 7th Avenue right. upstairs and uh, went to one of his rehearsals and there was uh, somebody didn't show up. O.C. was sitting in the, in the reed section playing the first alto part. Oh, you know? no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's his arrangements, you know, like he uh, had some tunes called Minor 7th Heaven and uh, things. <laughs> and uh, yeah. he also sang at, at this dance. I remember him singing, you know. Had a good voice, you know. Like it's, drummers like to sing, you know. <laughs> right. And uh, he was no exception. In fact, uh, I don't know if I'm right about this, but it seems to me like I saw a recording that O.C. made for Columbia Records called "O.C. Can You Sing?" And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's the guy. But nobody else uh, remembers yeah. ever seeing it, so I, I may be wrong about it. it yeah. Might be a dream. Maybe it was. <laughs> Uh, that was O.C. Johnson, Wendell Marshall. Now, the um, the trio that backed Coleman Hawkins on, on all these great records for Impulse, of just a couple of years, just a year or two later, was yourself with Major Holly and Eddie Locke. Now, was the trio with O.C. and Wendell a working trio? No. Behind no. Hawk or no? No, it no. wasn't. No. Okay. At the time that that record session was made, was your work with Hawk pretty much on a pickup nature? You know, when he'd have a gig, he'd call you for it or... Or what? Or or were you working steady with him uh, at that point? We we did about a, I did a, about a, a year of steady work with him. I think that group not not that steady that we were working year round, but right. uh, we, I guess maybe we did a couple weeks uh, here in New York. Then maybe we would go to uh, Europe, and we did a couple of weeks in uh, in. Uh, Great Britain, and then come back and maybe uh, go in the studio and do a couple of things. Mm -hmm. but, um, it, it wasn't really a, a full schedule of playing with that group. But he, he seemed to like uh, playing with uh, these uh, guys from Detroit. <laughs> that bunch, he'd yeah. say. <laughs> <laughs> How did it happen? How did the birth of the trio with Major and Eddie come about? Mm -hmm. I think probably because uh, they were uh, doing a lot of work on at the Metropole. Uh, Major was working with. Um, oh, wait a minute! How did it come? We couldn't have a. There was a bass player that could never finish the job. We had about five or six different bass players. I guess Major was the strongest one. He was. <laughs> he he's the only one that could uh, finish this job at the Metropole, and uh, I think Locke was there also. And he was doing work with uh, Roy Eldridge. Roy, right. so, uh, came in with uh, uh, Roy's suggestion, I guess. I came in with, with Coleman Hawkins. And, right. And, uh, I might have suggested that uh, they call Major. So I don't know how to. But anyway, that we worked with that group for uh, for a little while, and he, he seemed to like it. Yeah. Uh, much has been made when uh, about Coleman Hawkins with a quote unquote harmonic style. They say he had a um, vertical style, and Lester Young had a horizontal style, and all that. Uh, how do you respond to that? And, and what was it like comping and being in the middle of all the harmony with someone like Coleman Hawkins? Where did you find yourself with him? 
uh, it was it was comfortable. I thought, you know, I could. Uh, I mean, he played a lot of uh, <laughs> played a lot of music, you know, and, and certainly knew of the chords in and out. But uh, uh, I didn't I didn't feel like uh, I was ever in the way, or or that he was. Uh, I was playing something that would. Uh, disturbing to him because he could, uh, when he'd hear uh, an altered chord, he could go right with it, you right. know. And uh, so it was a, uh, I think it was it was better for him, you know, like to have somebody that was wouldn't stick, you know, strictly to, uh, you know, just what was written, right. but but because uh, he certainly didn't, <laughs> you know, and he and he liked doing that, um, you know, taking his liberties with which, that's what it's all about, you know. Yeah, playing this music. Well, why don't we go to the album on Impulse called Today and Now, the Coleman Hawkins Quartet, and this is with Tommy Flanagan, Major Holly, Eddie Locke, and Coleman Hawkins on tenor sax, September 9th, 1962. And uh, we'll hear two selections from this record. The first one, Don't Sit Under the Apple Tree with Anyone Else But Me. Uh, he likes, I don't know, for some reason he likes those old kind of... Yeah. Uh, Almost kind of public domain songs. Mm -hmm. P.D. Mm -hmm. right, but that's right, because on this record there's also uh, Go Lil' Liza, uh, something he called sw Swinging Scotch, and Put On Your Old Gray Bonnet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think he just wanted to do them once for, I don't know, his, uh, for the family or his old sweetheart or somebody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, let's hear from this record, Don't Sit Under the Apple Tree, and then one of the uh, pièces de resistances from... Uh, both Tommy and Hawkins' entire discography, something called The Love Song from Apache. Oh, yeah, he loved that, yeah. Let's hear it, and then we'll come back and talk to Tommy Flanagan. Thank you. 
just heard Coleman Hawkins, one of his masterpieces of masterpieces, love song from Apache, and before that, uh, Don't Sit Under the Apple Tree with Anyone Else But Me, both from the album Today and Now on Impulse Records, and Hawkins on tenor, Tommy Flanagan, piano, and Eddie Locke, drums and mallets there on that last track, So Tasteful, and the great Major Holly on the bass from 1962. Tommy Flanagan is here in the studio with us here at KCR. And uh, this is a perfect 
uh, time to ask you about your approach to the piano and voicings and things and uh, I mean I've I've long had this feeling I mean not not technically <laughs> tell me all your voicings <laughs> but I meant um, I've long had a feeling that uh, you know that the 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 best of of for what you know called concert classical music whatever you want to call it the best of it pi pianistically uh, from the late 19th century into you know finds its way into some of what you do and on a and on a on a recording like that, I mean, it's 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 obvious that uh, what's happening with the piano is not just a, a piece of music with a bunch of chord changes on it and just uh, standard old voicings and, and things like that. We're talking about composition and the whole the whole thing. So where 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 did that come into your into your music? Uh, well, I had a <clears throat> I've always kind of had a, a, a interest in. I guess like Coleman Hawkins, you know, like in classical music, and, and you know, listened to it from an early age. <coughs> Detroit was a great, a great place to hear a lot of uh, good music. You know, like you know, on your way to school, you know, like early in the morning, you used to wake up, and and the wake up music would be uh, uh, some classical, light classical music. You know, something that a child could take in. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, and not not too heavy, you know. So, so, but, uh, but then the school systems were pretty good in Detroit too. And uh, I don't know. I I um, kind of had a, a ear out for uh, uh, bigger sounds, you know, like orchestral sounds. And and when I was uh, able to like figure out a few things myself, you know. Uh, and I started putting these things together on piano, and they uh, started sounding like some of the things that I had been hearing, you know, like growing up. And, and so, uh, uh, sure enough, you know, like uh, the longer you uh, stay with uh, thinking like that, and then you you hear more music. And I was uh, attracted by hearing uh, some of the French Impressionists, you know, like. And uh, getting music uh, early in studies, you know, at WC and, and uh, some, a little Ravel, and, mm -hmm. and, and certainly uh, my uh, first uh, uh, getting real structure in music was from, you know, playing some of the Bach uh, early things, you know, those uh, uh, inventions and, right. and those things, and, uh, which leads to more. Uh, Modern approaches to music and harmonies, and, uh, uh, which uh, eventually, you know, like you hear people like uh, uh, Art Tatum, and, and you start listening to the piano uh, literature and, and uh, the library and, and what people in jazz are doing, and it certainly is, is a line between, uh, I mean, a serious line between people that play the best of. Uh, uh, jazz on their instrument and classical music there's hardly any difference to me I mean there's nobody that played any more piano than Art Tatum and, or Bud Powell you know, and, uh, uh, Teddy Wilson for that, that matter to yeah. bring it up to uh, what, what people are you know like what they were playing and, and studying in uh, like say Juilliard because Teddy taught there to a jazz class not necessarily jazz I'm Sure, he taught uh, like how to, you know, just how to get a, a good uh, touch and sound out of the piano. And, uh, but these are, uh, this is what I heard all through uh, my life uh, in in music growing up. And, and uh, how did the actual uh, uh, transformation come from hearing it, you know, and and in. in into the keyboard, and then not only you know taking you know some piece that you liked and and reducing it to your to to a piano version and, and harmonies, but being being able to incorporate it the way you do like on a recording like that, or indeed on on virtually any recording you've ever made, where these little uh, where these beautiful moments occur. Uh, uh, would you take the the actual things that you learn from these pieces and consciously adapt them to the voicing of a of a tune you're playing, or or did it just happen? Uh, well, 
<coughs> not, not consciously, you right. know, but uh, but you kind of uh, you have to do it quickly. <laughs> we're in right. a studio seeing a piece of music sometimes for the first time, and, and uh, so I mean, time is money, as they say in these studios. So you you know, like you get your thing together real quickly, and it's uh, so you either get the picture of what you want to do real quick and and uh, make it as pretty as possible and it's logical to everyone you yeah. know involved you know whoever you're playing with and and uh, whoever's going to listen later you know we played a, r a recording before of you uh, Bud Johnson and the Brass Giants for Riverside with Clark Terry Sweet Sedis and Nat Adderley and uh, and uh, Ray Nance and you share the piano bench uh, on the on the uh, I should say the gentleman who shared the bench with you on the other session was Jimmy Jones, mm. and uh, Jimmy uh, he's another one of those right. <laughs> Could you talk a, about him for a moment, uh, ju just about Jimmy Jones, because I know that he was into Debussy too, because I think he even made a record of uh, of Claire de Lune at one point. Uh, could you tell us about him, and did he influence you in that direction, or was it already done by that point? Uh, I certainly listened to him, and he he was an influence. Uh, as far as you know you know extending your harmonies on the keyboard to uh, not just you know sevenths and you know that uh, just the uh, normal extensions that you just run into anyway but uh it gets into the the larger uh, broader scope of of harmony and Jimmy Jones always kind of had that from uh, I mean, it would just perk your ear up. Uh, the first time I heard him, uh, uh, I think it was some kind of up-tempo piece, and just in the middle of it, he played these uh, out-of-tempo chord clusters. I mean, it sounded like bells coming. Yeah. I said, wow, what is, you know, like, that's that's beautiful yeah. uh, music. And and I I did hear him in person with a wonderful trio. It was Steph Smith, Jimmy Jones, and uh, Swin. John Levy. John Levy was still playing bass, and uh, wow, with Steph Smith with his double stops and triple stops, and Jimmy with the upper, I never heard, you know, like, it's really exciting to hear harmonies coming out of, like, these two people, like, uh, yeah. and it was, which makes you, uh, always kind of broaden me, I wanted to uh, delve a little more into, like, how do you get pretty sounds like this, and you have to sit down and, and work it work with it yourself mm -hmm. and then you have to listen to a person too and I got a chance to know Jimmy uh, and I like to it's probably one of the only reasons I uh, really wanted to uh, accompany a, l a little bit b because I like the way he did it and he did it so well yeah but he once told me he says don't do it too long <laughs> or you'll forget how to play the piano <laughs> and he was just about right. Yeah. Yeah. We're talking with Tommy Flanagan, and uh, it's 523 here on Jazz Profiles. And uh, we're going to get to some music in just a moment, but I want to ask one more question that came up from that last uh, that, that last conversation. That was, uh, you mentioned about great pianists, and we mentioned, uh, and, and you mentioned Art Tatum and Bud Powell and Teddy Wilson, just to name a few others. And uh, certainly they're big influences on you. And, I've even interviewed you up here before where we've talked about your formative influences. So, but uh, I'm curious about Bu about Bud Powell. Uh, you're talking about Jimmy Jones and voicings and chords and things. Uh, now, Bud Powell, was his main influence on you, like in the, uh, what, what, what I would call the spinning of lines, you know, in the in the long run of making melodies and things, and was there a side of Bud that was also concerned with those kind of uh, voicings, too? This must be uh, a, a silly well, I don't question, I don't know. No, but I don't think Bud was so uh, so much bothered about uh, the harmonic uh, aspect of it, you know, like right. as, as uh, branching out and making it bigger, because he, I mean, he could do that uh, when he played his, his solo lines, which were, I always think of Bud as being a, uh, uh, almost like a, a bird on piano, it's an, like, uh, yeah. a Charlie Parker or, or an extension of of it because he certainly did things that uh, uh, were revolutionary for his uh, piano playing at that time. You know, uh, 
But his, uh, when you hear him, I don't think his, uh, these guys I'm talking about, they had uh, hands that were bigger, and Bud had a small hand, you know, mm -hmm. which uh, I guess had something to do with yeah. uh, how you extend harmonies, you know, like you take well, somebody you like that. huge hands, though. <laughs> 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 oh, of, no, nothing, just uh, not really, they were normal, but maybe right. a little, I worked at it, you see. Uh, stretching exercise. <laughs> a rat. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, but someone like uh, Ellis Larkins has a large hand span, and he uses it to great advantage. Yeah. And he he can get that uh, colors, that real yeah, yeah, orchestral big sound, you know, like and and with the touch, you know. It's, uh, there's another unsung hero, the keyboard. Yes. I heard him last time I heard him in person was at uh, a concert that Ruby Braft, I think it was last year, the 88 festival, and he did some duets with uh, with Ruby. I think they had made some records together they years did, ago. Yeah. And just to Brilliant. hear that sound come out, oh my God, it was, yeah. really, it was really a thrill. Yeah, he's, he is a hero. As is our guest Tommy Flanagan, and we're going to get right back to some more music. And uh, right now we're going to turn to uh, a handful of, of the most historic and most reissued uh, record sessions that uh, Tommy's on from the 50s. We'll begin with uh, Miles Davis and Sonny Rollins, Art Taylor, Paul Chambers, and our guest Tommy Flanagan, and I'm sure you know this record well. Could you tell us uh, which track you'd like to hear of, of, of the of the three? Hmm. How about Veered Blues? Veered <laughs> Blues. <laughs> How, I don't know where, where it came from. Uh, yeah. Uh, maybe they, does it say? No, it doesn't. No. Who wrote it or anything? Well, let's listen to it, <clears throat> and then we'll come back and talk with Tommy Flanagan about it. He's on this recording. Miles Davis and Sonny Rollins, our guest Tommy Flanagan, Art Taylor, and Paul Chambers, The Veered Blues. <laughs> Thank 
Miles Davis at a, a very interesting time in his career, uh, early 56, and uh, I'd like to ask Tommy Flanagan to just tell us about how, the, about how that record day came about and how the grouping came about, because uh, Miles had already recorded with what was to be known as the his quintet of those years with uh, Red Garland, Philly Joe, Paul Chambers, and Coltrane, and here he is uh, with with you and Sonny Rollins and uh, and and others, how, mm. how how did that happen in the in the context of that group already being formed? Well, I called them to all together. <laughs> I said, I got my birthday. It was my birthday, as a matter of fact. Right. Um, no, but uh, <clears throat> I don't know. I think it was supposed yeah. to have been um, uh, Kenny Clark's date, actually, and I don't know. He was unavailable, and uh, At had done work with. Miles and uh, Sonny, and I was called. I I guess I hadn't been in New York that long, and so uh, it was we struck up a relationship again. You know, uh, Miles and uh, I met everybody in the in Detroit, uh, maybe about a few years earlier. Had uh, you played with Miles when he came through and played the Bluebird? Yeah, or those different the Bluebird. Players? I played with him there. Right. Uh, there were some memorable sessions there. Miles and Sonny Stitt and uh, Miles Ward, Wardell Gray and, uh, and several. Uh, Miles with uh, Frank Foster. Oh, it's oh, it great. That's when uh, Billy Mitchell and uh, Thad Jones they had the group there right. with Elvin. And, uh, it was burning nights every night. <laughs> I mean, it's really, uh, really something. But I, I remember that, and uh, and this date was a, it was a half a date because uh, I think it started snowing like mad, so you know, we didn't want to risk uh, not being able to get home. Uh, so it, we just called it over, uh, uh, called it short, and there wasn't any really hardly any music for the date. You know, mm -hmm. like it was yeah. one of those uh, accidental dates, I guess. And, uh, you know, like, uh, what's that song on there? Uh, that would have been your... Uh, Rubeck's uh, In Your Own your Sweet, Sweet Way. Way yeah. Miles had s pulled it out of his back pocket, Some just a few... Uh, uh, had sketched down some changes, you know, and, and an idea for the intro, which was, was his. And, uh, so it's, you know, yeah. that's, that's the way that one came about. That would have been your 26th birthday, right? 26th, right. Right. Mm -hmm. and that's in March, I believe, so that, March, yeah. that record date must have been in March. Mm -hmm. 36 minutes after the hour, 5 o'clock, we just heard the Veered Blues with uh, Tommy Flanagan and, and Miles Davis, and uh, you mentioned it was one of your first dates upon coming to New York, and uh, and that's, that's, that's right, because uh, you made the uh, record called Jazzmen Detroit, 
1955, and then New York, we have this session March. 1955, that's not right. But that's not right. No. That's, uh, I didn't come to New York until 56. 56. Yeah. And uh, that's when you made that the record with the... Uh, I made oh, one the with uh, Thad and Billy. That was right. before. Right, right. right. That, that one called Detroit, New York Junction, I think. Right, right. Uh, uh, which we have here. Uh, but also, of course, this record that I call Jazzman De Detroit, this album with is with the one that came out now is Kenny Clark meets the Detroit Jazz. Oh, right. right, okay. We're looking, by the way, we I am looking at a discography that Tommy uh, bought a copy that I could. I hope I can Xerox. It was in the Great Swing Journal. You can have it. Oh, I can have this copy. <laughs> hey, thanks. Sure. Uh, and then comes this session, March sixteenth, nineteen fifty-six, and then we jump into May, and uh, in May we get a record with Kenny Burrell uh, with Kluke. And in June we. That's a good date for. Uh, yeah. For Kenny's uh, introducing Kenny. Introducing I think Kenny Burrell, and we have a whole bunch of records here with Kenny, including one of mine that's a favorite just because of the rhythm section is you, uh, Kenny, Oscar Pettiford, and Shadow Wilson, which is just thrilling to hear, and uh, I think that's that record, the Detroit New York Junction. Right. Yeah. Right. Thad and Billy Mitchell. Right. right. Uh, anyway, and then we get to this next record we're about to go to here, June twenty second, nineteen fifty six, a day that will live in, in jazz history, because this is uh, the day that uh, they made Sonny Rollins' uh, saxophone Colossus record, and um, I know sometimes you know uh, jazz writers or DJs or people who ask questions tend to maybe to build things up or romanticize them and say it's one of the great. You know, jazz record days, and that day, did you know that it was, and all that kind of stuff. And I realized that at the time, I guess it was a, it was a record date and right. with Sonny Rollins. It's turned out to have been, in hindsight, one of the great records of all time. Uh, any memories of that day? You've probably been asked about it, I guess, a lot. But uh, any thoughts about that? Any recollections or or uh, views of that record? Yeah, date? that was another one of those uh, fast recording dates. Uh, we know the, the date was coming up, and uh, Doug Watkins was, we were living in the same apart small apartment house uh, uptown, and Doug was living a floor ab above me. I think uh, Max went up and uh, knocked on uh, Doug's door, and, <laughs> and Sonny knocked on my door, and uh, we went and, and did the date over the, at Rudy's. Yeah, on, uh, I think it was still in Hackensack then, mm -hmm. but it was... Uh, yeah. I mean, it's a. Uh, uh, when you look back, it's, it's, I marvel at uh, you know like this, how well they they came out because <laughs> you don't have a clue of what's going on, you know, like uh, uh, or what you're going to record or anything. Mm -hmm. you know. I had no no idea that uh, uh, more tot was called, um, you know, Knife. Mac the Knife or <laughs> <laughs> or that Saint Thomas was uh, you know what it was. Yeah. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, the this one I like from there is uh, I like Sonny's uh, his original pieces, and I like that uh, Strode Road, which has, he has a way of writing these odd tunes with the uh, with the funny bridge, you know, short bridge. Yeah. I think it's the four bar bridge. Uh, yeah. Here it is right now. Our guest Tommy Flanagan with Sonny Rollins, Max Roach, and Doug Watkins. This is the Strode Road from 1956. <laughs> Thank you. 
original recording with Max Roach, Doug Watkins, Sonny Rollins, and our guest Tommy Flanagan, who is the focus of this, the second of two jazz profiles. Uh, you're listening to WKCR-FM New York, 89.9 on your FM dial, coming to you in stereo. It's 546, and we'll be on the air until 8 p.m. tonight. And again, we just heard the original version of Strode Road with Tommy Flanagan and Sonny Rollins. And... Uh, Tommy, was that record date mostly a one-taker record date, or, or were there more than one take done at, at these sessions? I think that was one take, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It uh, seems like tenor players don't like to play more than, more than one take. You've had so much recording experience. What's your view as to uh, the belief some people have that, uh, that, you know, that the most spontaneous things happen on the first take, and then after that it's a case of d diminishing... Re yeah, it's, returns. It seems seems that's the case usually. How, but I, how do you approach it on your own re re record days? Will you do like a rehearsal of a tune and then do a real take, where you just like start the tape going and? and I should because I found out that, uh, you know, when you're just running it through, sometimes you, I mean, you you're giving away some of your best stuff <laughs> right, right there, and uh, and then you're trying to remember maybe something good you thought you did while you were. Yeah before and it's I think it's, I think it's good to use that first take but I'm I always get trapped because uh, I always think I can do something better you know or, or something something in there I can hear that's wrong which is which is bad about listening to things right away you know at at the session at yeah. the session right? yeah so you can find so many things wrong right. you know, that well. you'll never find you know like later on you say well that's okay. I can live with it. You know, <laughs> a lot of us couldn't imagine anything wrong happening at a, at, at a Tommy Flanagan record session. But uh, your point's well taken. Uh, sometimes it's, it's better to go back to a record session after you've forgotten all the emotions and all the things that happened, and right. try and listen to it objectively. But uh, that certainly wasn't necess necessary in that case because that's one of the classic records of all time. It's called Saxophone Colossus and. Lord knows it's been reissued many, many, many times and will yeah. undoubtedly always be in print. Well, your, your uh, collection here is <laughs> really well used. Well, you see, the, the, the next, you see, we, 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 we've <laughs> called on three collections here. And uh, my collection, I want to thank Dan Morgenstern, made a whole bunch of rare things, including this little EP, which I have in my hand here with Charlie Shavers, which uh, no one has ever seen before. No, I and certainly haven't. And uh, and the KCR record collection, which is what Tommy's referring to, because this next track, which is from uh, another one of those records that uh, will always be in print, because it's one of the great jazz, great of great jazz albums. John Coltrane's Giant Steps records, our station copy here, looks like it was run over by a train or something, because it it's it's actually split apart. It's been played so much and used yeah, that's, so much. That's, uh, looks like one of those old, uh, you know, when you go into those stores with used music. <laughs> old sheet music, <laughs> like, yeah. That the cat was all on. brown and yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that's giant steps the way it looks now. And it, almost not that. Really, it's not that old. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a reissue anyway. Uh, well, of course that that means that we we are turning to uh, the Giant Steps album with John Coltrane. I'd, but before you recorded this, John Coltrane had really. Um, already recorded with you with Wilbur Harden and also uh, as a member of, of your date that came out as The Cats on right, yeah. on Prestige Records. So this was by no means the first time that, that you were in the studio with John Coltrane. Could you uh, sketch out your uh, your uh, friendship with John Coltrane for us and just how it led up to, to Giant Steps? Uh, we, uh, when I moved to... Uh, uh, when I moved to New York... He was, uh, John was living about two blocks from me, and I'm, I was on 101st Street, he was living on 103rd, and uh, I used to see him, uh, you know, quite frequently in the, in the, uh, in the neighborhood, and then uh, he was, uh, when he started working with uh, uh, 
uh, was it Miles or uh, I think it was when uh, he was working with Monk. Really, yeah. was this is when I really got to know him a, a little, know him better then, uh, as I was uh, check, checking out Monk as well as as uh, Coltrane. We were we were friends, but uh, but I was go down to the I think it was the five or the half note. No, five spot. Five spot, yeah. And, uh, and he was, uh, he liked, you know, he, he's another one. He could deal in harmonies. He was really uh, on the piano. He Train? Could, yeah, he could find some some harmonic devices, of course, you know, from the things that he wrote. Was, uh, um, you know, those giant steps and that whole uh, album was kind of challenging, you know, harmonically. And, uh, and he likes to, uh, he's very serious about his music, uh, you know, like from uh, when he'd go into something, whether it was composition or uh, or just his horn, you know, like he'd really delve into it, you know, when he went into uh, the soprano, you know. I didn't even know about, you know, until he just came out and started playing soprano, and he was, looked like he had thoroughly, you know, like a wood shedded on it before he came out. So it was, wasn't uh, anything like a... Uh, uh, what is he doing that for? <laughs> you know, he said, "Wow, listen what he's doing." You know, he was—he's uh, uh, really a terrific and thorough musician, and really believes in what he was doing. And, uh, and uh, I think we had a good relationship to, together. Yeah. He's, I liked to uh, i liked the way he used to uh, learn songs so quickly. You know, like. Well, he and Sonny Rollins had had that quickness about learning, learning pieces. And I I wrote this one piece. Uh, I th I think you played it earlier. It was on the Cats album. It's called uh, Minor Mishap, or you know the other a one, uh, a ba -doo -ba -doo -ba -doo -ba -doo, uh, whatever that is. A Coopsa. Uh, no, not that Coopsa. one. It's a uh, Solacium. Ah, Solacium. Yeah. Here it is. Uh, yes, right yeah. in front of me. Right. Uh, yeah, but it was, you know, it took me a, a little while to get it together. Man, the first time he ran it down, he was just <laughs> played it like he had been playing it all the time. So it's, he's really Im impressed me. Like, it's another wonderful musician. Yeah. Well, we catch John Coltrane at the uh, fascinating crossroads in his career because this record was recorded right around the time when he was. Uh, going to be leaving Miles Davis and start playing with his own quartet and start forming it. And uh, and again, this is the record called Giant Steps, which of all the pre-John Coltrane quartet records is the best known and, uh, and one of the greatest. And our guest, Tommy Flanagan, was the pianist on the session. Uh, Paul Chambers and Jimmy Cobb? Oh, uh, no, it was uh, A.T. Arthur, Arthur, Arthur Taylor. Arthur Taylor. And, uh, you know, I hear Giant Steps a lot uh, being played. But the one I like on there is a spiral. It's a that's a real challenging piece. And, uh, Anything you can tell us about it before we hear it, or sh uh, should we hear it and talk about it after? Yeah, because it's been so long, I I can't really remember. I I know it just goes down in half steps or something. Our guest Tommy Flanagan with John Coltrane, Spiral from 1959.
As we continue with the music of Tommy Flanagan, uh, we turn now to a gentleman who's uh, who really had a kind of a an academy for for jazz players in the fifties. All the great musicians passed through his his band, and that's the great J.J. Johnson. And uh, we're going to hear something, I think, from the first record. Now, I have this discography in front of me. I'm pretty sure this is... Mm, no, this, not this the first one. J and K? Yeah, the... Uh, collaboration, yeah. Yes. This is called uh, First Prize... Or first Place. First Place. Yes. Yeah. Uh, this is recorded in April 1957. Max Roach on drums, Paul Chambers bass, Tommy Flanagan on piano. And, of course, oh, you... Oh, there must be something before that, because that, right. that came out of... Um, uh, we had some days off on a gig in Philadelphia, and we came over right. to New York to record right. that. Because you had already recorded, actually, uh, about three or f three albums with uh, Wilbur Little and Elvin Jones right, yeah. and Bobby Jaspar, that, that great band. And we do have those recordings, too. But I'd like to start this set with J.J. with something called Commutation, which is yeah. kind of a version of uh, Confirmation. Confirmation, I believe, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. So this begins with Tommy Flanagan with J.J. Johnson, Max Roach, and Paul Chambers. Thank you. 
And from Tommy Flanagan, we heard him with J.J. Johnson. And the first track was called Commutation, which began kind of as a piano feature. And uh, Paul Chambers and Max Roach, also in the rhythm section from 1957, Tommy Flanagan, J.J. Johnson. And as Tommy mentioned before we played it, that happened while the band, I guess, was on a break in a club engagement. And you, just, yeah, you guys so drove into New York and made the date. And then we followed that with Laura by the working J.J. Johnson Quintet. Uh, yeah, that, yeah. That, that's another fast date. You know, it went down so fast. Yeah. We made two albums that, that one afternoon. In one afternoon? Uh, first place in Blue Trombone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we heard Mr. Uh, Laura, which was recorded with Nat Adderley on cornet and J.J., Tommy, Wilbur, Little and Albert Tootie Heath, of course, the band had also had Elvin Jones and Bobby Jaspar, and actually we didn't hear anything from yeah. from, from that band, but we did hear you with J.J. Uh, Johnson. Could you tell us what it was like working with uh, J.J. With, with Johnson? Yeah, he was another uh, good arranger and composer, uh, yeah. you know, innovative soloist, you know, on his instrument. Yeah. And uh, he was good. He was good, uh, very, uh, Sounds very good leader, good. you know, yeah. like he was straight straightforward and uh, uh, he took care of business when he, when he was on the road and yeah. uh, he was good he was uh, good to work with yeah. one thing that I noticed going through uh, some of the some of the records looking for you know for the piano solos and where they are and all that stuff uh, and some of the J.J. Johnson records I really noticed more than than many of the uh, other ones that uh, there really seemed to be almost every track is some kind of arrangement. I mean, it, it's 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 rarely just melody and solo. Yeah, and, he was and out. he was well arranged. Yeah, he was, I mean, he could and he wrote things yes. that were were good good to play. Mm. Yeah, and uh, some of his uh, ballads are really really beautiful things. You know, lament and enigma no. is a, um, yeah. one that's not played enough. You know. Have you had a chance to uh, play with him since, since he's come back on the jazz scene the last uh, several years? No, just on a few uh, all-star things they get together once right. in a while. Uh, yeah, he's playing just about like he did before. <laughs> he's yeah. almost at that peak, but he's... You know, I guess that instrument, you can't stay, stay away from it that long. Something about the chops or so. Yeah. yeah. That's Tommy Flanagan, and he's been uh, he's been up here now for uh, for a couple of hours, and I'd like to thank you for your time on this Sunday afternoon evening and uh, shepherd shepherd. <laughs> Listen, I'm I was taking us through happy to be here. Okay, man. Well, and, it was and a, I'm glad and honored to have you. What KCR is doing for the music and 